French, Russian, Chinese, industrial. Revolutions are there to be exported, and the Iranian is no exception. Where it didn't take fertile root, the Islamic Revolution in Iran ran into opposition from the West as well as from its neighbors. But has the Iranian Revolution reached its limits, or is it only just starting? Join me, Yan Darash, on how we got here. The soaring of relations between Iran and the Western world, especially the U.S., started in 1979, when the Pahlavi dynasty was overthrown during the so-called Islamic Revolution, making the end of a monarchy in Iran and the birth of a theocratic Islamic Republic of Iran as we know it today. The last Shah of Iran, Reza Pahlavi, maintained close ties with the U.S. to prevent his country from falling to the Soviet sphere of influence during the Cold War. The next major event which tore a rift between the U.S. and Iran was the hostage crisis which unfolded between 1979 and 1981. A group of militarized college students, supportive of the Islamic Revolution, took 53 U.S. diplomats and citizens hostage. They were held for 444 days. Since then, relations between the two governments and by extension their societies have only gone downhill due to what the Iran called differences between the Islamic system and the American system of governance and Washington's support of Israel. However, this animosity would be put on pause between 2015 and 2016, when the U.S. reached a deal with Iran, which agreed to limit its nuclear program. In exchange, most of the sanctions previously imposed on Iran were lifted. That is, until the Trump administration unilaterally pulled out of the nuclear deal and reimposed all sanctions on Iran in 2018. In response, Tehran upped up its uranium enrichment program, heavily in investing in the country's nuclear capabilities. Analysts now say that Iran may already have five nuclear weapons and is capable of producing twice as many by May of this year. Iran also leads the Middle Eastern coalition called the Axis of Resistance, which heavily opposes Israel's sovereignty. As long as they continue to be fueled and, and, and supported, that there is a real chance for it. So we have to eliminate the problem, not just by, by attacking the tentacles by issue, but ultimately uh, eliminate the source of all. And, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, the solution is to put an end to the regime in Tehran, which is the godfather of terrorism in the first place. In the wake of the war in Gaza, Tehran has been arming Yemen's main terrorist organization, the Houthis, to fight against the so-called Zionist entity, further tarnishing its relations with the Western world and other Middle Eastern countries, which do recognize Israel, such as the United Arab Emirates. I'm delighted to welcome Łukasz Przybyszewski as our guest tonight. Uh, he's the founder of the Abhasid Foundation Fund. It's a think tank which specializes in the vast area of the Middle East and North Africa. Is that yeah, that's true? correct. Yeah. Okay. And also, uh, you can say, he's an Iranian affairs expert. So welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Um, first of all, we'll start with uh, where it all started, is the, the Iranian Revolution. I can remember being a kind of... Um, older teenager. My focus was on solidarity in Poland and Eastern Europe. And the uh, overthrow of the Shah and the Ayatollah Khomeini taking power, that seemed to come as a surprise to us here in Europe. How would you gauge it? Was it a surprise? Was it a revolution that was long in the making? How do you judge that? Um, well, from my perception, it seems that the Islamic Revolution was a process that started very, very early on. And it was actually expected. I mean, no one wanted to talk about it loudly. No one wanted to just um, float the idea that, well, the Shah will either soon die or will be deposed because he is now seen as weak. Uh, well, the truth is that um, the spiritual leaders in Iran have a very, very long history of opposing the Shahs. So very often they, they went along with the rulers. For example, they uh, launched together uh, a campaign first to mobilize the population, then to wage war, like in the 19th century, for example. Um, but in the end, uh, it turned out that the ulamas, the spiritual leaders, uh, the clerics, came up with this idea that perhaps having a king, a shah, is not the best solution for Iran. Because when they looked back at the, hist uh, the history, they saw that very often they, Iran just didn't have the capacity and the capability to oppose the Western powers, to oppose Russian colonialism, actually, because they had also wars with Russia. Yep. And 
for a, for a very brief moment, they also aligned with Russia and invaded Herat, but then uh, the Brits just kicked them out and occupied Khart Island. So that's how it, it, it all uh, was going, uh, going forward, that Iran always had to back down, back off. And in the end, uh, we had this situation in which uh, this, the, the clerics just didn't see any other alternative than to take power for themselves. Uh, the idea of Veloyat e Faqih, so the uh, rule of the jurisprudent, jurisprudent here, of course, is a cleric, uh, was born in Ayatollah Khomeini's mind. But uh, he was inspired by other clerics in Iraq while he took refuge there. And in the end, uh, you asked me whether it was actually expected. It was we can see that Khomeini was uh, seen as a possible alternative, some kind of like, let's, yeah. just like John Paul II, yeah? yeah? A spiritual leader who could turn the tides. Okay. Was, was he answering a spiritual need in Iran for a, 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 a reorientation of, of, of the, of the uh, mood of the times? Yes, that's an excellent question because, first of all, Iran is a multi-ethnic state. So, um, in 1935, uh, Reza Khan uh, established Iran instead of Persia. Yes. That was one of the steps. But later on, you know, to have a national identity was extremely hard, especially when uh, Reza Mohammed Pahlavi was referring to the pre-Islamic times all the time. It wasn't just enough people for, uh, for, uh, for Iran's people. It was just, you know, something they couldn't imagine. It was too far in the past. So they needed to have this more Islamic identity, culture, and, and that's why uh, Khomeini also was so attractive. The other reason was that while Iran was progressing in the, uh, in the 20th century, uh, also we had um, migrations to the cities, Tehran, etc. And th those were people from the countryside. They had yes. different uh, expectations, different imaginations. And when they simply saw that, okay, we have those people from the West Beat, French, Russian, uh, American, it didn't matter. They just saw those, those foreigners and they saw that, okay, they actually, uh, they actually have extraterritorial rights. They can't be, they can't be fined, they can't be jailed, you know. So who's running so the country, answer, actually? Yeah, so it's a, a, a spiritual need and an anti-Western wave of... Yeah, precisely. And they were also uh, very much tired of the, of the West and East clash. You know, it were the 70s. We, uh, everyone saw that it's... Either it will end now or never, yeah. or just soon. Yeah. The, the, um, the we had a, uh, a it was a young revolution by young, young the young generation yeah. in the country, um, and then uh, did it try to export its Khomeini, what's known as Khomeinism abroad, or was it a case of uh, a mix between? wishing to export its Islamic revolution, um, especially its Shia. Uh, version, uh, or was it? Did the Iran's neighbors want to quell, quash this revolution? Like, for example, we saw the French and the, the Russian Revolution. That we had to, great powers had to nip it in the bud. How do you see that the the, the early 1980s, huge Iran-Iraq war, yeah, well, lots of uh, Western involvement, yeah, and a huge loss of life on both yeah. sides. Yeah, I mean, no one actually knows how many people died. It's just counted in hundreds of thousands. Uh, yes, the revolution, uh, on one side, there was this uh, strive to quell the revolution. But on the other side, uh, Khomeini knew that exporting revolution by arms and by, by sword is just not the, 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 the good solution. Um, if we take into account the history of the Shia, we see that it's not that it, it never the Shias the Shia 
branch of Islam did not spread by Quran and the sword, it spread more by the message. So that they oppose uh, the, the, the Sunnis, yeah, generally. And that's also the approach that Khomeini took. He thought that, okay, actually our influence should be more organic. It should spring there where it's needed, where people actually uh, crave for it, for our support. So that was his idea. Of course, he knew that he has to fight Iraq and Saddam. Yes. He had no choice. He knew that it's, it's a plot uh, by both Eastern, Western, all state. Everyone just wanted to have a stable Persian Gulf so the oil would flow. And once this war ended, well, the revolutionary fervor actually also ended in a way because people saw that suddenly, okay, we neither lost or won the war. Now we have to just rebuild everything, have a normal economy. So throughout the 90s, uh, the state had an enormous uh, influence and control over the economy. It was actually more like, a, uh, so to say, socialist state yeah. from our perspective. Where did, where did that leave Iran as a country? We had uh, it, the, the, the ending of the Iran-Iraq war. Uh, did it seek to promote a particular kind of uh, Shia uh, orthodoxy, if that's the right word to use it. Um, is it possible to see tensions between Iraq and the Sunni world as a kind of Catholic Protestant mm -hmm. parallel, if, if that is apt? To a certain extent. Is, is, it, is it a conflict within the world of Islam, shall we? Yeah, I mean, when we look at the conflict uh, in the world of Islam, especially between the Sunnis and Shias, we see that the Shias are the Protestants, but they have the clerical hierarchy, which the Catholic Church has, while the Sunnis uh, don't have such a uh, hierarchy. Uh, so it's more uh, decentralized, yeah? Uh, uh, whether Iran wants to popularize a specific thought branch, well, to a certain extent, only to a certain extent, because the, rev the Islamic Revolution in Iran turned out to be more a national revolution for Iran. And this revolution was, as I said later on, to inspire uh, other religious leaders, especially Shias, like in Lebanon, Iraq, etc. So they saw that the, that the idea of the Vilayat al-Faqih, so the rule of the jurisprudent, mm -hmm. can have not only a religious edge, but also a political edge. So suddenly, uh, you know, the position of such, uh, such imams just uh, became much higher. Okay, let's bring this up uh, a bit up to date. Um, Saudi Arabia recognized the uh, existence of Israel. Um, Iran hasn't. What is the, what does that exacerbate the uh, relations between the two great branches of Islam? And how does that influence um, Israel? How do, you, how, do you, how do you see Iran's foreign policy in the region as we see it today? The, mm -hmm. the Houthi rebels, uh, Hezbollah, yeah. um, support for Hezbollah in Lebanon, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, basically, we see that Iran's approach, and also if we're taking Israel into account and Saudi Arabia, and how they uh, and where they still have influence, is very much alike uh, the very early, uh, early Middle Ages, the Sassanid period, or even previous uh, the Achaemenid uh, period, uh, just to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we see that their foreign policy is typically imperialist. They want to control the region by, uh, by, by exerting pressure through the, made, the, the most important uh, bottlenecks and, and just, you know, strategic uh, locations. So that's Yemen. We know what's happening now in the Red Sea and Bab al Mandeb. And that's also Lebanon, which is seen as a counterwave to, to Israel. So, uh, and yeah. And uh, while Iran is trying to in have bigger influence in the region, it's very much constrained, by, constrained not only by the 
vastness of the region, but also by, by its capabilities. History begins with geography. Yeah, it all begins with geography. It does not have sufficient resources to control whole Iraq, whole Syria. No, it has, let's uh, so, to, so to say, Shia franchises there. Yes. Yeah. So. And a uh, final question. We mm -hmm. unfortunately have to wrap this fascinating discussion up. Um, the nuclear question. Yeah. Um, why does it need it? And does Iran have the will to use it eventually? Mm. Yeah, uh, so Iran's nuclear program would not gain pace without Russia's support because Russia actually helped Iran to build its nuclear facilities in Bushehr, so the first nuclear power plant, yeah. And uh, in my opinion, that's also why uh, Saudi Arabia sides with Israel. Iran will eventually declare or show that it has a nuclear weapon, or it already has one. It's just stored somewhere in the basement and it's ready, uh, ready to, to, uh, for use. They just didn't run an uh, underground test. So if the absolute priority for, for the regime is the survival of the regime, Never, it doesn't matter whether uh, Khamenei, uh, Khamenei's uh, successor of choice will become the next supreme leader or someone else, or even perhaps a military re uh, regime yes. would, would gain power. Uh, the survival of the elites yeah. is their priority. It's a fascinating internal struggle as well, isn't it? And, but uh, unfortunately, uh, that's probably a subject for the ne our next discussion. Which a have. very long one, yeah. Um, so, Łukasz Przybyszewski, thank you very much for coming on to the programme. Thank you for having me. Great to have you. And uh, that's all we have time for today. So, join us again on Monday for How We Got Here. <laughs>